Hello, everybody. Just starting by acknowledging that wherever we are, was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land, and acknowledge in particular the country on which I'm located and, and on which the campuses of Swinburne's Melbourne, uh, sorry, Swinburne's Melbourne campuses are located, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Pay my respects to their elders past and present and their leaders emerging. Acknowledge the relationship between people and country and acknowledge country itself. Clearly we're all around the country. So if you'd like to note uh, what Aboriginal country you're on today, please feel free to do that in the chat function. Uh, as Rhonda said, I'm the Director of the Centre for Social Impact at Swinburne, and it's my privilege to moderate today's uh, brief session with you. And I know there's some pent up excitement about uh, the project and the findings, so I won't take uh, long. I just wanted to make a couple of very brief comments before we get on with the show. Uh, those of you who know me know that uh, social entrepreneurship and social innovation has been my source of interest for over 25 years now. And I think, um, you know, this piece of work marks a turning point in our collective thinking about scaling the impacts of social entrepreneurship and social innovation more broadly. Historically, we've been very focused on scaling individual businesses, but over time, we've collectively realised that uh, we need to scale and strengthen the ecosystem in order to support uh, the individual organisations that operate within it. So that means that um, we've uh, got this particular piece of research that's been commissioned by Paul Ramsey Foundation, and I think it's a really exciting turning point, and certainly from the feedback we've received from people about the work um, thus far, uh, that seems to be the case across uh, the ecosystem, not just the sector. Um, so I think it's going to be an exciting opportunity to hear some of the findings. And also, as with all of our webinars through CSI, we're particularly interested in hearing from you. And we know when we run uh, webinars related to social enterprise and social entrepreneurship, and I can see from the guest list, we've got a lot of deeply experienced people here. Please feel free um, to use the chat function to connect with each other, uh, to share your questions and insights in relation to the work. And we will make sure we've got plenty of time for our discussion and response to those questions a bit later in the hour. Um, to provide some context and to introduce the project, I'd like to hand over to Abilash Mudliar, the Chief Portfolio Officer at Paul Ramsey Foundation. And uh, he will then introduce Libby, who will be presenting on behalf of the research team. Over to you, Abilash. Great, thank you, Joe, and, and thanks everyone for, for joining this afternoon. Um, just a couple of introductory comments um, around the motivation and background behind why we commissioned this study. Our mission at Paul Ramsey Foundation is to break cycles of disadvantage in Australia, and towards this end, we launched an impact investing and social enterprise program about two years ago um, as a means to um, leverage these um, emerging industries um, as a path towards furthering our mission and as a complement to our more traditional um, grant making activities. At the outset, we did a lot of research into the landscape um, to try and identify roles um, for us to play. Um, and you know, one of the initial findings um, we came across was that, that there were an estimated 20,000 um, social enterprises um, across Australia. Um, and so we really wanted to understand what the support ecosystem um, around these social enterprises looked like. For instance, you know, we heard that there were a lot of incubator and accelerator programs um, set up to support early stage social enterprises, providing a wide range of services, including um, strategy development, um, testing and fine tuning products and services, maybe strengthening team and governance, designing impact measurement systems, and also um, in some cases facilitating capital raising for social ventures. Um, and while there had been some research on the landscape and most notably, I think a really good guide that Social Change Central published in 2018, we thought there was a need for a more detailed and consolidated data on the range of programs that are active in the market, um, their business models, um, their services, um, programs that they offered and, and to identify sort of broader opportunities and gaps in the market. Similarly, we also noted that there exists several apex bodies, uh, both at the state and national level that focus on broader market building activities um, in Australia um, through things like advocacy or supporting networking, um, supporting research, setting standards for performance um, and the like. 
And again, we felt it was important for the market to have good quality data on the landscape so that funders can make more informed choices and stakeholders can identify gaps in service provision um, that new providers can potentially take opportunities of. And so uh, late last year, we commissioned um, the Center for Social Impact at Swinburne to conduct a detailed um, landscape mapping with a goal to produce a report that's freely publicly available um, and that can act as a resource to actors across the social enterprise and impact investing ecosystems. Um, so with that um, introduction, I'm really excited to participate um, in the webinar today. Um, and I'd like to hand over to Libby now for um, the most interesting part, which is to um, take everyone through the findings. Thanks, Libby. Thanks, Abilash. And I'll just share my screen. I actually think probably the most interesting part will be the discussion, but um, hopefully uh, what I have got to present here to you today will um, help to prompt some of that discussion. So just move my screen around a little bit so I can see. So um, hopefully everyone can see the slides in front of you. And I'd like to also acknowledge that I'm speaking today from what was, is, and always will be Wurundjeri country. And before I start, I'd like to also acknowledge the report co-authors, Dr. Mike Moran and Dr. Amber Earls, who are gonna join us for the discussion after this very brief overview of some of our key findings. We'd also like to thank all of the research participants. I, I know um, many of you are present today for generously sharing your time and insights and knowledge. And we'd also like to extend our thanks to the Paul Ramsey Foundation for commissioning this research and to Avalash for his support and guidance. So this research is focused on the idea of an entrepreneurial ecosystem and specifically Australia's social entrepreneurial ecosystem. An entrepreneurial ecosystem is a concept and it's used to describe all of the elements needed to grow and sustain entrepreneurial activity, generally within a specific geography. So there's quite a few different ways of thinking about those elements, but Eisenberg's seminal work proposed six domains and you can see that on the slide in front of you. So these domains interact to make entrepreneurship more likely um, more prevalent and self-sustaining. And some of the elements are people or organisations and others are environmental, such as infrastructure or culture. So today's webinar is focused on the various organisations in the Australian social venture context that contribute to and or intersect with all of these domains. This research focuses on those organisations and their programs that either um, provide support to social ventures, but also organisations that serve some sort of ecosystem or um, representative function. And as such, they may actually operate at different levels in the ecosystem. So we, if we think of a venture as being akin to a single organism, some organisations focus their work on individual ventures or, or groups of ventures. Others mainly work at the market level, so between ventures and other aspects of the ecosystem, such as um, customers or capital. And others work at the ecosystem level and sometimes beyond. So just quickly to touch on a couple of terms you may have, you will have already hear us mention. In this research, we use the term social venture to capture the different type of social purpose organisations that exist in Australia's ecosystem. So as you can see on this slide, the research isn't limited only to the social enterprise form. It includes other business model forms along that spectrum from relatively minor trading activity um, in welfare and charitable organisations right through to income derived exclusively from trading with a motivation to generate some degree of social value. Similarly, as you heard Avalash mention before, we're using the term or the idea of apex functions in this research, um, which was suggested by PRF to describe the typical sort of system building activities, such as those that you can see listed. And therefore we use the term apex organization to describe organizations undertaking these activities, which may be peak bodies, industry bodies, et cetera. 
The research had two aims. The first was to develop a comprehensive understanding of the program-based supports available for early stage social ventures. So often you may hear these being referred to as accelerators or incubators, but we were also aiming to identify and understand apex organisations in the Australian social venture ecosystem context. And to answer these questions, we used a mixed methods approach which included an initial um, desktop scan and an existing knowledge scan. And then we administered an online survey to which we invited participation from the organisations that we'd identified via the scan, but we also promoted it widely through our social media channels and networks. And finally, we conducted 52 semi-structured interviews and hats off to Amber who did the lion's share of that interviewing it was no mean feat. So let's move on to some key findings. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about two overarching findings today, but as you'll see, there are a lot more in the report. So firstly, we found a highly diverse array of organisations that are part of Australia's social venture ecosystem, either providing program-based development support and or serving ecosystem building roles. And if we look at the program supports firstly, and noting here on this slide, we're identifying programs, not organisations, we found that they tend to fall into four broad groups. So the first, what we called um, uh, type one, very imaginatively, are those that have the specific aim and focus on increasing the quality and number of social ventures in the ecosystem. But then we found another group that focus on the engagement, on, on engagement in entrepreneurship um, by people or communities who are socioeconomically marginalised. So um, um, an example of that may be a business incubator for migrant women, for example. Then we had a group of programs focused on high growth commercial ventures. So these are probably what you think of as your archetypical accelerator in the commercial ecosystem, but they also have a focus on um, and the ventures that participate in them sometimes have a focus on making a positive contribution to society. And finally, the last group of programs focused on um, focuses on economic um, and community development through place-based entrepreneurship. So um, these programs are often run by or with local governments and social ventures may be part of their cohort, but it's not their exclusive focus. So what we saw was um, from these four broad groups that we had the highest response from that first type of program, but there are these others that um, do fit within and identify as being part of Australia's social venture ecosystem. And you'll see in the report that most of our focus was actually on the type one programs, particularly because this was most central to the scope of the research, but also because whilst the other types clearly produce social impact and produce ventures and entrepreneurial activity and outcomes and outputs, they don't focus on the production specifically of social ventures, if that makes sense. So when we cast our mind to this second question, we also see diversity in the organisations that are serving, at least to some extent, apex functions. So this is the ecosystem building and coordinating activities. And what we found here is that in the ecosystem, it's not only what we might call the peaks or networks or industry organisations that are doing this work. In fact, we had 24 organisations whose core work is at that intra-organisational level. So they work with or for social ventures, offering specialist services. Um, they may be consultants or offering support programs, but they are also doing quite a lot of the apex function work at the moment. We also identified a group of organisations. So 
me, motorbike going past my house. Um, what we've called the betweens, whose core work is as a market connector. So they connect ventures um, to another side of a market that exists within the ecosystem, such as social finance or social procurement. And they too, at the moment, undertake, undertake many of the apex functions beyond their core work of connecting and facilitating different sides of a market. And then we have the representative bodies and networks that we've termed the behalf of. And many of in this group in the Australian social venture context are fledgling because it inc includes many of the um, relatively newly established social enterprise networks across the country. So um, it's as well in this group are uh, um, organisations like B-Lab in the social business space and also the impact investment in, um, industry and intermediary bodies. We also need to acknowledge um, that this research didn't include ventures themselves, um, many of whom also undertake ecosystem building work. So moving on to our second overarching finding, we wanted to highlight today um, relevant to both the programmatic supports question and the apex organisation question is that Australia's social venture ecosystem is highly resource constrained. So throughout our interviews, this issue emerged time and time again in many different ways, but there was a general sense that the ecosystem's resource constrained nature is actually a characteristic of the ecosystem itself. As a product of either or, the tension between optimising impact and profitability that many, but not all ventures face, but also the market failure context in which ventures operate as a means to generating impact. So the result of this is that many, or indeed most ventures, actually can't afford to pay the full costs of the support that they require and also the representation and ecosystem building work. So there's market failure too for many of the ecosystem support and representational organisations, as these quotes both indicate. And one's from a with for type organisation and one's a behalf of organisation, both indicating that they can't actually um, raise sufficient revenue through charging fees to the ventures themselves. So the implications of these resource constraints emerge through our research um, as um, manifesting for both the type one program, so the programmatic supports, and also at the kind of apex function and apex organisation level. So for the type one programs, we saw it resulting in things like the ephemeral availability of program delivery. So programs tend, tend to be offered if, when and where there's funding available. And similarly, the duration of programs seems to um, often be based on the budget that's available and what's affordable rather than the duration of support perhaps that a startup venture might need. Similarly, we saw um, that uh, type one programs are highly generalist in their focus gen um, or tend to be. So they don't focus on a specific venture form or industry or beneficiary group. And in fact, we saw that some shift focus depending on the funding that's available. And finally, type one um, programs in this ecosystem have highly complex revenue models that differ quite a bit from their commercial counterparts. So in the commercial ecosystem, we tend to see that revenues derive from take, are taking an equity stake in the ventures that are supported. Whereas in the social venture ecosystem, we found only about 10% of type one programs derive some revenue from investments in their ventures but 53% are charging some form of participation fee, even if that doesn't reflect the true cost of service delivery. In terms of the apex functions in this resource um, constrained ecosystem, what we're seeing is that organisations at all levels of the ecosystem are stepping up and filling many of the varied um, gaps um, that relate to ecosystem building. 
So what does all this mean? Well, put plainly, currently, the ecosystem's messy. It's hard to predict who does what, when, um, when programs will be offered, where, et cetera. And in short, this messiness makes the ecosystem hard to navigate from those, for those of us that are inside it and hard to understand if you're on the periphery. One possible um, response to this could be, where needed, better resourcing of the behalf of organisations and particularly those like the emergent networks who rely a lot on voluntary labour and short-term funding, um, but with more resourcing could perhaps lead more of the ecosystem coordination, navigation and networking work, as well as taking um, a bigger role in the advocacy work as well. And this in turn could have the um, potential to free up the other resources available in the ecosystem at the between and the with for if you like, levels, so that they can then focus their available resources on the core um, work that they're doing, either to support ventures themselves or to do that market intermediation work. Now, this is just an idea, so it'd be really interesting to get your responses to it in the chat and as we, um, as we open up for discussion as well. So, in conclusion, our research suggests that Australia's social venture ecosystem includes a diverse array of programs and organisations that provide venture support and or engage in ecosystem building activities. We also found that the ecosystem is highly resource constrained and as a result, it's messy and difficult to navigate. These resource constraints, however, may never change. Unlike the commercial entrepreneurial ecosystem, the particular nature of social ventures, their market failure context and their prioritisation of social value creation sees many ventures unable to pay for the full cost of support and representation. So if we're to see a thriving, mature and optimally impactful social venture ecosystem in Australia, the costs of venture support and ecosystem building require resourcing beyond what can be contributed by the social ventures alone. So that concludes the presentation and I will now stop sharing and I think we're going back to Joe. That's right. Thank you, Lib. Um, Terrific overview of some of the key findings and noting for everyone that uh, those who participated in the research have already received a copy of the full report, but Rhonda has put up the uh, link in the chat function for the full report if um, too much is never enough on uh, the research for you. Uh, it's now going to be great to um, invite uh, Mike and Amber to join Libby and Abalash uh, for some Q&A. I'll kick that off with some uh, questions that I've got and um, then we'll start to bring in your questions as they start to appear. And I can see there's at least one from Cameron. Um, oh, and Alberto and David. Oh, there we go. You're going off. Excellent. As I expect. Thank you very much. Um, we're not going to hold and do, you know, an elaborate long-winded preset panel discussion. We're much more interested in answering your questions. So I'm going to call time on the uh, fixed questions fairly quickly, but I did just want to make a couple of reflections as, as the um, research elder in the space. Um, the messiness, I think it's an interesting mirror to the messiness of the social venture sector, if you like, in Australia. And while not for the same reasons, you know, we've got a mixed economy of social enterprises and enterprising not-for-profits in Australia, partly because we don't have distinct regulatory forms for them and partly because of our regulated system. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, to make the observation that historically we've always looked to Canada with a sigh, oh, Canada. Um, and, you know, 15 years ago, I was commenting on Canada's investment in the intermediary system and, um, you know, both by government and philanthropy. And that was, you know, as Libs picked up in the, and, and the teams picked up in the findings, you know, a key factor in the um, underpinning um, security and uh, jumping off point for the kinds of social innovations that the sector produces. So um, just really wanted to make those, you know, uh, opening reflections. But enough waffling from the distinguished professor and now on to the people who've actually done the work. Um, really, I've got a few questions and, and we'll just see, we'll just give ourselves 
about six or seven minutes on this and then move into um, the questions that you have. And if, there, if there's any time left, I'll ask the remaining questions at the end. Um, now, I guess the first question uh, for Abalash, um, was it surprising to you that the programs did not always include social impact specific content? Uh, actually, it was it was uh, uh, a little bit surprising at first, um, Joe, uh, to observe that that finding um, in this research. I think having sort of thought about it a little bit more, one possible explanation for that, that, in my view, is that sometimes when we're talking about a social enterprise or a social venture, impact is um, almost assumed or taken for granted, um, given that that's the inherent motivation um, or the inherent intent uh, of the founders of a um, social venture. And as a result, um, it's understandable why the focus of programs tends to be a lot more on the business and commercial aspects where perhaps there are sometimes larger capacity gaps or just more pressing needs um, to begin with. Um, and uh, uh, given the limited resourcing that Libby just described that many of these programs operate under, um, it, perhaps that's where um, you know there's a there's a emphasis placed um, over um, the social impact content. Mm, um, yeah, that would be a hypothesis. Thanks. And um, even though I don't think it's either or, I've always been intrigued by the presumption that the business side is the complex side and the social side is the easy side. And we're starting to see. For those of you who are stick, sticking on to these webinars today, we'll be doing. I'm doing involved in another webinar on social procurement later. Um, you know, uh, two thirds of um, social procurers aren't setting particular social impact goals. So I think you know it, it, we're seeing a little bit of that kind of um, uh, movement in the opposite direction, uh, if you like, uh, in the context of social procurement. Um, Libby, a question for you. What about the role of capital? We know that this is a challenge for social ventures generally, and you've talked about the highly resource constrained nature of the, um, uh, the uh, ecosystem. What's the role of capital and what needs to happen? Thanks, Joe. Well, actually in the report, there another really key finding, particularly around the um, programmatic supports, um, accelerator incubator stuff was um, also the, um, the kind of mismatch of capital at the moment. In, in the ecosystem that's available for those early stage ventures to start up and grow. Um, and so it emerged time and time again, that in some ways um, it's somewhat, I guess, anomalous to, for us to be talking about um, venture support and development in the absence of capital. And actually the strongest model would be a coupling together of both capital and support. And we've seen that previously and it's come out of things like the review of the social enterprise development investment funds that you and the team did back in 2015-ish. Um, so, um, you know, this, this, this thing again about that development support and implementation support and capital are kind of sides of the same coin, if you like. And so there's a, there's a real need for um, what we probably term appropriate capital um, to support development and support, as well as the sort of broader resourcing of the ecosystem. Yeah. So that the issue about appropriateness of capital just comes up in every piece of work we ever do around this and every conversation we ever have with a social entrepreneur and really, you know, like you reinforcing that it's two sides to the coin um, because I do think we can tend to get a bit siloed and that sort of, I guess, goes back to, you know, Abalash's um, uh, um, hypothesis to a degree as well. Um, you know, we're still building the hybrid workers and the hybrid knowledge uh, in this space where, you know, we've got um, rather than pulling down on one source of expertise and another, actually the people and, um, and infrastructure that's competent at that um, point of intersection uh, still growing. Um, a question for Mike and not for Abolash. What? Why doesn't philanthropy play a bigger role or just fund it all? Um I think philanthropy does play a fairly big role or as, as big a role as it, it, it could to some degree. Um, I think in many ways the task is too big, as Libby alluded to. It's a, it's a complex system with many actors 
and some of it's around the coordination and messiness of that system. But I think if we look at sort of institutional philanthropy as a, a source of capital in the, the social economy, you know, it's less than 2%, institutional philanthropy is less than 2% when it comes to resourcing not-for-profits and charities and sort of almost negligible when it comes to social ventures. Um, I think maybe coming back to what Libby was saying earlier around appropriate capital and, you know, as uh, many years of research has shown, maybe that's a, a, a place that philanthropy could extend its, its um, influence. So innovating in terms of social finance, more creative use of corpus for patient capital and so forth. But philanthropy as an actor is not really in a position to, to fill, you know, the many gaps in the ecosystem, of course. It, you know, as we heard earlier, it funds, you know, it co-funds a lot of the, the fees for many of these programs, but it really can't fill all those gaps. Thank you. And I'm going to do one last, throw one last question to Amber, and then we're going to open up to the tsunami of questions and comments uh, that we can see in the chat feed. Go team. Um, and um, I would just like to note that we may not get to every question, but we've got a good 25 minutes for um, the discussion. So we'll do our very best to get to as many of them as possible. But Amber, before we do that, um, just wondering, um, you know, in relation to the sort of fairly even distribution of organisations that were playing an advocacy role, I know that you had some particular interest in the emergence of the um, representative networks. I'm just wondering if you'd like to say anything about what you observed in relation to those. Yeah, I think it was really interesting. We asked a question around at the very beginning is who plays um, a role at the systems level um, in the social venture ecosystem. And there were a lot of organisations from in those categories that Libby said that we've called them behalf of with for or um, jump in and let me know that they don't have forgotten to between. Sure. Um, so there are a lot of different types of organisation at different levels in the ecosystem who are providing a sort of a representative role or playing that, serving those apex like functions. And part of it was around that some of these um, organisations were really newly established. So we're seeing a lot of the social enterprise networks are just really forming. Um, they're, they're more formed in, along the Eastern seaboard, but not as much across the rest of the country. And so they're not yet playing that role that a traditional peak might be in, in sort of commercial business ecosystem, like an accounting or um, a, a law firm, firm might be in, in the commercial ecosystem. Um, wouldn't be providing community educational advocacy, for example, but, but that's what's happening in, in the social venture ecosystem that you've got organisations that usually would just be providing support to social ventures one-on-one -on -one or as a group, or you've got organisations that are playing an intermediary role also undertaking some of those apex um, level functions. And so it's really... Um, be, we bring it back to the resource constrained nature and emergent nature of those sort of representative organisations like the social enterprise networks being the reason for those, um, those voids being filled by other types of organisations. And so, yes, um, one of the gaps or opportunities that this research has identified is greater support for um, organisations like those social enterprise networks so that they have the opportunity to really fulfil their representative function. Um, and then the other types of organisations have the opportunity to focus on their, their core activities. Thank you. So thank you everyone for answering my questions. Now we're going to go to the many questions we have in the chat and also noting like good social entrepreneurs, you're sharing your own resources, tools and advice with each other. Please feel free to do that. Um, you know, we're a broad church and it's important that, um, you know, when you come to these webinars, one of the value adds is that uh, people provide extra information about resources in the chat, um, but we won't go through in detail. It's not because we're not interested in promoting your, your um, resources, it's just a matter of time. Um, so I'm just, I'm slightly stunned about where to start. I'm gonna to go to Sally McGeoch's question. Um, and uh, maybe uh, see if Mike and or Abalash would like to make a comment. Uh, was the messiness of the ecosystem also linked to how it's funded and how many are competing for funding 
uh, which inhibits potentially inhibits collaboration across the apex organizations. So, Mike? Um, yes, uh, to a degree. I think sort of building on Amber's point, it's, um, you know, it's such a nascent field. We're looking at here, you know, sectors and industries take sort of generations um, to develop. So accounting being a classic example of one that has a very established industry and set of peaks. Um, one thing that was evident with respect to some of the interview data was that there is a bit of sorting going on, which was touched on earlier as well, in terms of some of those peaks in a specific area or quasi peaks um, in social enterprise, uh, developing a sort of impact investing, uh, ecosystem developing, B Corps. And a lot of these organisations kind of do work together um, and tend to respect those boundaries. Um, so obviously resources uh, would uh, constrain that to some degree, but there is a fair bit of kind of collaboration and recognition of the different subfields within the ecosystem. Mm, thanks. Abolash, what about from a philanthropic perspective? What, what are you seeing? Having, having worked uh, previously in the, I guess, impact investing social enterprise markets in other countries overseas, India and the US um, specifically, one thing that surprised me when I returned to Australia is just the significant quantity of apex bodies that operate in the market here, and especially the fact that almost every state um, has its own um, uh, state-based uh, social enterprise apex body. Um, and so I think that that may, um, you know, I think the, the hypothesis that, that Sally's posed in her question uh, may have some merit. Um, but I think, again, as as Mike said, you know, as a, as a funder, it's important to um, see active collaboration and uh, sort of a avoidance of duplicity of activity um, uh, between different actors. Um, and it's pleasing to note what, what Mike just described as some good examples of, of collaboration there. Thank you. And that feeds nicely into a question that Donna's asked. Um, and uh, I mean, you've sort of slightly touched on it, but I might just check in with Lib about this, which is about the, um, you know, to what extent is the shortage of resources exacerbated by um, more supply of organisations. So the question is, you know, uh, did you see in the research duplication and, you know, overlap that's perhaps unnecessary? Oh, sorry, Donna, I just completely paraphrased you there. Probably inappropriately. I think what, we, what we're seeing is because we've had this resource constrained environment, particularly when it comes to those kind of apex functions and serving that ecosystem building role. As I said earlier, um, we just see, you know, it, it's partly, I think, everyone in the ecosystem being kind of um, wanting to make a difference and enthusiastic for the progression of the ecosystem that in the absence of um, the, particularly the kind of behalf of organisations being adequately resourced and perhaps not even being around, you know, um, a number of them um, give, you know, five years ago, that everyone sort of has just stepped up to fill the gaps for everything. So I don't think it's duplication of effort and I actually don't see it as competition as such. I think it's organisations feeling like there's gaps that need to be filled and in our true entrepreneurial style, we step up and do it. Um, but what that means then is things aren't necessarily well coordinated or organised or it's not clear who does what and who has responsibility for what. Yeah. And I think, you know, so duplication of effort I don't think is intentional. So that's kind of at the apex level. And then, in fact, in, in terms of program delivery, like um, what Abolash said earlier on, he was, you know, in the intro about the number of kind of support programs, incubators, accelerators out there. In some ways, it seems like a lot. But again, they're not constantly operating because they bubble up and bubble down when funding's available and when there's a partner who wants to do something, et cetera, et cetera. So whilst it looks like there might be a lot out there, in fact, it's this constantly kind of moving feast. But I, I don't think it's duplication. I think it's responding to, to needs as, you know, as, as we feel that they're necessary. Thanks, Lib. And I think, you know, that part of that also goes to the, sometimes highly context specific needs. Um, you know, we're a large geography, 
and a small demography and that creates particular kinds of pressures in Australia that uh, we don't see in some other contexts where the land mass is smaller and the population is more distributed. Um, I would like to go to a great question from Sharon and um, I'm just going to try and get through as many of these as possible but Sharon um, Zigovic has um, made the observation noting she is a um, complex system specialist that uh, an identified limitation of many studies of entrepreneurial ecosystems is that they focus on all the components, but not the relationships between them. And Sharon's wondering whether the study did look at those relationships, and if not, whether that's you know potential for you know um, study stage two. And I might um, ask uh, Lib and Amber about that. You can go first, Amber. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I think where we found the connection because we were looking at the support programs and we were looking at the apex organizations and where the connection was was in the resource constrained nature or, or the, the fact that social ventures couldn't pay um, to either access support programs or to fund the, the full cost of running a representative body so that's I suppose where we um, saw the relationship between the two parts of the ecosystem that we were looking at um, but I definitely think there's more opportunity for further research. Lib, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think we didn't, I mean, we would have, you know, loved or it would be fascinating to do some sort of network analysis of the ecosystem. We, um, I, like, we did actually um, ask in the survey whether there were other organisations that um, were doing similar work or that the particular organisation responding to the survey responded, you know, um, uh, works with or, or connects with. And so we have got a little bit of data on that. Um, and similarly, in the interviews, there was lots of discussion about other players in the ecosystem. What I'd say is what kind of emerged quite a lot is this, um, in terms of relationships, a lot of organisations in the ecosystem are aware of other organisations and do a lot of um, informal cross-referral and navigation and connection. And actually it's probably, I mean, I know from some of the other work I do working with social enterprises that a lot of time is um, devoted to trying to point, so it's this sort of navigation task because the ecosystem is so complex. So you know, keeping your head around who's out there and what they're doing so that when someone asks you for help, you can point them in that direction. So that kind of relational stuff um, would be, you know, and there's so much room to understand that better. But it's also one of the, um, I think, one of the most resource demanding aspects of, of that kind of ecosystem navigation at the moment because of its complexity. Absolutely. And, I mean, the issue of the costs of collaboration, um, uh, you know, has been something that everyone's been grappling with for the better part of 25 years, both inside and outside of this space. Uh, so, you know, very important insights. Um, Abilash, I might just uh, turn to you with both your PRF hat on and your international experience with um, whether you've got any thoughts in response to a question from Catherine Kennedy, which is, um, is there any, um, you know, do you have any insights about tipping points or the necessary conditions in a nascent um, uh, intermediary ecosystem to incentivize the different players to either specialize, um, to specialize and to recognize their roles in, in a growing market? That's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, most overseas markets, even ones that are perhaps a little bit more progressed or uh, further along in their journey are not quite, um, are still very much for the most part in different stages of infancy. And that's just the nature of, of social enterprise, I think, in different parts of the world. I'd say one of the things that the research highlighted was the need for wayfinding um, in the Australian market. Um, and I think that's an area that I observed in other markets is a little bit more um, established, um, where there's just greater information sources and awareness um, and sort of transparency around how uh, ventures can access appropriate types of support services um, at different stages of their development. Um, I think on the capital side, it's always a lot more challenging, um, especially where, you know, um, sort of quote unquote market rate returns 
are not available? Um, and how do different investors with different risk return appetites actually collaborate together um, to develop capital solutions that work for enterprises at different stages of their journey? Um, and again, we see the advent of blended finance um, in some other markets where it's a lot more advanced and um, I guess easily accessible uh, relative to Australia. Um, so those would be a couple of things that I'd say to that, um, Jo. Thank you. Um, and apologies to everyone who's putting up great questions. I'm looking at both the chat feed and the um, panel, so I'm slightly um, distracted. Uh, um, but um, just wanted to pick up, I uh, won't pass it to the panel, but just a comment um, from Russ Wood saying, what are the lessons from the commercial venture ecosystem that could be drawn from in the social venture ecosystem? I think, I mean, I'll just make a comment as a research elder in the space, acknowledging that um, the team did use um, uh, pre-existing conceptual models that have been empirically generated from commercial, the commercial venture ecosystem in the work. Um, so as researchers, we're always seeking to learn and um, that's important. I don't wish to be divisive about it at all, um, but also to say that um, one of the things that we find in this space is that there's usually a fair bit of um, uh, latent knowledge in the, in sort of, um, uh, parallel spaces in the social impact space um, that could also be drawn upon and in fact in the past some government initiatives that have um, sought to invest into social versions of commercial models have actually been complete policy failures I'm not as I say I'm not meaning to be divisive about it it's not an either or I think it's a both and and there's a fair bit of nuance to the issue um, I want to go um, uh, to a question that Pippa has just put up and Pippa noting that you had another question earlier on and I'm not avoiding the political questions. It's just me going down the list in a certain order. Um, but um, maybe to pick up um, uh, with Amber uh, in the first instance, um, you know, where did the climate emergency feature um, in, uh, in the research that you did, like did, did, did was it was it part of the conversation in relation to this specific topic? And noting that Pippa's question is a bit more existential than that, but I'm tying it to this particular piece of research. And the short answer, Joe, is no. I mean, we we had um, some really good conversation. We in we did the survey and we asked where where um, particular programs were targeted, uh, where they targeted environmental issues, and some were. Um, but really, when we did the survey and the interview, there, there wasn't a huge theme around the climate emergency. Thanks. I'm interested in that because we know that in the um, uh, impact investing space that um, while not all impact investors in Australia will be focusing particularly on the climate emergency, we do know that environmental sustainability is the, you know, the bulk of where um, uh, current impact investing is occurring in the Australian context. Again, I think, you know, it, it's interesting, there's almost a theme emerging in both questions and answers about um, uh, silos and, uh, you know, um, the, the connections between them, which uh, Sharon's very ably pointed out, uh, needing further attention. Um, I'm just going to pick up on um, uh, for Mike and Lib a, a comment, but to get your feedback on from Paul Bird, which is that social ventures need different support at different times. So an ongoing relationship with capital and support is welcome. I'm just wondering what comments you might have on that observation from Paul. I know we're all in pretty fierce agreement, but you may want to extend. I guess my comment would be yes. <laughs> Um, it's absolutely, I think, the case, and 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 that's borne out in the in the more detailed um, discussion in the report. That in lots of different ways, the enduring um, relationship is really important, and the needs um, and that ongoing support for enterprises, both financially, but also in terms of the other kind of resource su supports that they may need. Um, as um, they're developing, as um, there's contextual changes or shocks or whatever it may be, is really, really important to the sustainability of the ventures themselves and therefore um, the broader ecosystem and the impact that's created. Thank you. Mike? Uh, yes, again, uh, a big yes. 
Uh, interestingly, when coding, which is, you know, a fancy way of saying reading the transcripts and um, sorting the interviews, you know, a dramatically, you know, apparent theme was around the missing middle and that lack of support, which we've heard about again over some years now. But, you know, it was a really strong theme across, you know, all elements of the ecosystem, the sort of missing middle around support. So I think we're continuing to um, observe that same challenge. Thank you. Um, and a comment, a question from Kate Saunders, which is particularly for the research team, possibly slightly for me, but Lib can be the elder in this space. Um, what are the key recommendations from CSI for the sector for action to reduce the fragmentation and improve the effectiveness of the support that are being provided to social ventures? Are you throwing to anyone in particular, Joe? To you, Libby, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was typing an answer to a oh. question at the same time. Yes, this is the problem with all the private messaging going on. <laughs> Um, so there's lots of recommendations in the report around that, and some of them are to do with the kind of coordinate, coordination activities and making those clearer. And then I think some of them are actually just to do with if there was more, so also going back to that um, earlier comment about uh, how difficult it is to wayfind and navigate, part of that is because of this ephemeral nature that results from things kind of popping up and down all the time. Um, so, you know, we did, for example, think about having resources like, you know, directories or an online resource or something, but I, even in the time between us undertaking the research and um, getting to here, the landscape's changed here again. You know, things have been, other things have got some funding and other things have ceased to be funded, et cetera, et cetera. So they're popping up and down all the time. So in reality, and whilst it seems counterintuitive, I actually think one of the key solutions to all of this is humans. And, um, you know, sort of human knowledge and contact and, you know, and there's a fantastic quote in the report about, you know, sort of, um, networks and technology sort of don't work on their own. It actually takes someone to talk to someone to understand what their needs are, to be able to, to help point them in the right direction. So whilst we can look to kind of natty ways of, of wayfinding or simplifying or coordinating, the reality is that our relationships and understanding those are probably the most important way of us becoming more effective and efficient and connected and coordinated. Thank you. There's an interesting parallel to that, showing my age in research. About 20 years ago, um, uh, there was a program of uh, regional community development very successfully established by the um, credit union movement. And then the federal government sought to replicate it. And the one thing they left out was the people who were the um, uh, navigators and boundary spanners between different um, organisations and different communities. Uh, and so the government version didn't work even, and it was really about the, you know, the dropping out of the people in the systemic approach. Um, here's a $64,000 question from Nina Yusufor, um, which is, uh, about, you know, it's the big question for intermediaries and intermediation about the impacts of the social impacts of this part of the whole ecosystem. So um, making the point that we tend to jump to the outcomes and impacts of the ventures themselves. And I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm saying this, not Nina. Um, sometimes intermediaries take great, you know, make grand claims of attribution to um, those outcomes. Um, rather than um, understand the, the impacts of the uh, intermediary and apex organisations. So um, have you got any thoughts about, you know, how to address that? And I might go to Mike first and then see if um, Abalash has got a comment. Uh, that's a, a very good question and quite a thorny one. Um, so that is, you know, essentially trying to establish the impact of the ecosystem itself or... Joe? Sorry, the impact of the... The ecosystem itself? Yeah, or, yeah. So, you know, well, I think what Nina's asking about is these um, these impact, these apex organisations and how they measure and communicate their impacts and how much we should be doing that in order to understand what's working and what's not. I guess that, again, comes back to that resourcing question. You know, these are bodies that 
you know, operate um, on a voluntary basis. Predominantly, they are supported by people who actually work across across organisations. So they might be, you know, they're a social enterprise. Possibly they're the program or incubator level. Um, I think you know, getting to that question of impact would be around you know resourcing apex bodies. Um, and I think that, you know, again, there'd be attribution challenges and so forth. Yeah, thanks. Abilash, have you got any final comments on that? Look, nothing beyond what, what Mike has said. I think attribution is always difficult to measure at the at the intermediary level. Um, I think it is an important question to ask. Um, uh, and if the resourcing is available and it's something that um, uh, uh, that you know we'd be open to to discussing with um, intermediary organizations um, uh, directly um, if there's interest in kind of measuring effectiveness and an evaluation of their work. Excellent. Thank you for that. And um, you know, at the risk of um, frustrating those who um, want to uh, you know get the attributions right, I think I've come to the conclusion that we should focus on building the commons and less on dissecting who's getting what done. Of course, I appreciate that there are, you know, significant resource implications um, when claims are being made about attribution, but, uh, you know, it is an incredibly complex space in which to accurately measure. Um, uh, I'm really conscious that uh, we're very close to time and we have not had an opportunity to answer all of the fantastic questions that you've asked. Without dropping the research team in it, I do wonder whether we might be able to take the chat feed off and um, uh, do some uh, very brief responses to uh, some of the um, additional questions that are there. I'm looking to Libby to see whether that may be acceptable. Um, and I have dropped her in at apologies. That's all right. And um, it's just awesome discussion of which I've caught, you know, a little bit because I can't do too many things at once. But I think it could be a really good basis for some really interesting blogs or, you know, um, some in, in ongoing engaged discussion around this sort of stuff. I, I think it'll be fun. So, yeah. Great. So we'll do, we'll, we'll do something um, with all of the extra questions that have been asked. Um, I did want to pick up on one final comment from another elder in the space, our friend and colleague, Mark Daniels, who made the comment and I now can't find it. Here it is, interesting contrast to 10 years ago when you could count the ecosystem organisations in one or two hands. Um, and I think that that is a good reflection for those of us who are feeling frustrated about progress. Um, uh, you know, a substantial amount of progress has already happened. Um, I particularly want to thank all of you for turning up, for contributing, for participating, the research team and Paul Ramsey Foundation for commissioning the work. Wish you the best for the rest of the afternoon and we look forward to ongoing discussions. Thank you.